Hi, my name is Joanna Molina Rosavi, and I am one of the cardiac electrophysiologists here at Texas Heart Institute. I'm going to be talking today about bleeding risk of anticoagulation. As introduction, uh, there is no anticoagulant that reduces thrombotic risk without sim simultaneously increasing the risk of bleeding. The decision to administer an anticoagulant is based on the assessment that the risk of thrombosis it is, uh, and its complications is greater clinical uh, concern than the risk of uh, bleeding and its complications for the specific patient at a specific point in time. So on the pathogenesis of anticoagulant-associated bleeding, um, the loss of vascularity integrity is important uh, because technically anticoagulants do not cause bleeding on itself. Bleeding is caused by a breach in the wall of the, wall of the blood vessel. However, anticoagulants interfere with the normal hemostatic process that resolves microscopic uh, bleeding events that would otherwise never become clinically apparent. Uh, as a result, anticoagulants may uh, contribute to hematoma expansion and may convert clinically insignificant bleeding to clinically significant bleeding. So other factors are breaches of vascular integrity by uh, may be mechanical ex like trauma, tumor invasion, thrombosis, uh, or hypertension, or it can be due to altered endothelial uh, cell barrier function, like the cases with sepsis, ischemia, or certain uh, chemotherapeutic drugs or biological agents. Microbleed is another factor and um, other subclinical bleeding events as well. Subclinical bleeding, uh, like cerebral uh, microbleeds and occult bleeding in other sites, such as uh, the GI tract, may present as clinically significant bleeding when the individual is receiving anticoagulant. Microbleeds are clinically silent minor bleeding events that are apparent uh, only in imaging studies. And these studies, uh, or you know, studies that have been looking at microbleeds, uh, the term generally is restricted to bleedings in the brain. So these are MRIs done in the brain uh, randomly to, on patients that are not on anticoagulation. And it seems that some people with certain risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, and other uh, things of that sort tend to uh, express some microbleeding in the brain. Uh, but the screening of cerebral uh, microbleeds or occult uh, GI bleed is not routinely used as one of, you know, uh, a factor to decide if we're going to start or not uh, individuals on anticoagulation. So risk factors of bleeding, um, well, there's many factors, and there's risk factors related to the anticoagulant itself. So uh, drug class is one of the things. In general, the risk of life-threatening and fatal bleeding is lower with the DOAX, or direct oral anticoagulants, uh, like the Bigatran uh, and uh, the direct factor 10A inhibitors, like apixaban, adoxaban, rivaroxaban. And all of these compared, of course, with the warfarin or vitamin K antagonist. Um, and also, the evidence of uh, this lower risk comes from several randomized trials that have compared the DOAX uh, uh, to, to warfarin itself in, in trials for atrial fibrillation or VTE. And the absolute risk in patients with AFib and VTE may differ because uh, um, these conditions may be distributed across the uh, population differently. They, they're very different uh, patient populations, uh, the patients with AFib and the patients with uh, venous uh, thromboembolism. So uh, regarding anticoagulation initiation, uh, there's numerous studies that have demonstrated that the risk of bleeding is highest during the initial period, uh, typically defined as the, as the first three months of anticoagulation. So uh, regardless of uh, the anticoagulant that is being started. Uh, the mechanism is not completely understood. Uh, one hypothesis is that um, Subclinical bleeding, if present, becomes apparent early in the course of anticoagulation. And uh, a related concept to all of this is that the uh, individuals who have not bled during the first three months of anticoagulation are a select subgroup or group of individuals who have an inherently lower risk of future bleeding, which is to be taken with a grain of salt because we see patients bleeding at any point uh, during anticoagulation uh, treatment. Dose level is another uh, risk factor, and of course the intensity of anticoagulation. Uh, 
there be e either prophylactic, therapeutic, super therapeutic, generally correlates with bleeding risk. Uh, the intensity of warfarin is based, of course, on the INR, for the DOAX is based on the standard drug dose uh, and which one we pick to, uh, for a specific patient. Although uh, dose intensity tends to correlate with bleeding risk, uh, studies using low intensity warfarin did not demonstrate a substantial reduction of bleeding risk by targeting a lower INR. Um, so there's also uh, the bias of the physician and it, on the inappropriate dose reduction uh, on certain patients that we feel are the too much uh, risk of bleeding. So we uh, presumably are driven by the clinician, cl clinicians and justified presumption that uh, lower doses will preserve efficacy while reducing bleeding. And it happens frequently with DOAX and will, this will lead to avoidable thrombosis, including a stroke. So uh, risk factors related to the patient uh, and that are, we can't change basically, it's uh, older age, of course. Uh, uh, the cutoffs are defined in, in you know, very, there's variable cutoffs for, for medications, for studies, for all sorts of things uh, or risks as well. Um, and of course the risk of bleeding is uh, increased um, with age and in, in, in it's linear basically. Higher than 60 years old is where we kind of start and then from there the, the risk is linear uh, to, to the age of the patient. Uh, Non-white race is, uh, are also at higher risk. Uh, there was a big cohort study of about 20,000 patients with AF, um, and basically on three-year follow-up, the highest risk of intracranial bleeding was amongst Asians compared to whites. It was about a 4.1 hazard ratio, which is pretty substantial. Following that is uh, Hispanics uh, and blacks with a, has a hazard ratio of about two um, compared to whites and the least amount of intracranial uh, bleeding happened amongst whites. Um, the sex of the patient, unlike thrombosis risk, which appears to differ between men and women, bleeding risk does not appear to, to differ significantly, uh, significantly by sex. Um, Prior bleeding is another risk factor, uh, specifically intracranial hemorrhage uh, is, is, is a big one. Prior uh, ICH confers an increased risk of recurrent uh, intracranial hemorrhage approximately 2 to 3 percent per year, uh, which is about a tenfold higher than uh, the general population risk. Um, and patients with uh, intracranial uh, hemorrhage can restart anticoagulation if the risk of rebleeding is less than the risk of ischemic stroke and its consequences. Now, this is a complete different topic on, on alternatives to start anticoagulation or not, and this is where uh, the, the mechanical ways of stroke prevention like Watchman, Lariat, and all those uh, um, you know, uh, devices come into place. Uh, GI bleeding, GI lesions can rebleed uh, with the risk of rebleeding somewhat predicted by endoscopic findings. That's why uh, we typically seek, uh, seek GI clearance uh, once they look at the lesion itself and, and, and they can give us some feedback on, on the safety of restarting an anticoagulant. Uh, Post-surgical, uh, of course, sites of surgical bleeding are generally considered to be tra transient risk factors, and uh, anticoagulation following surgery is often initiated within uh, one to three days or so, depending on the surgery, or as long uh, as there were no unexpected surgical issues that would increase bleeding risk. Comorbidities is another important thing, specifically liver disease, kidney disease, diabetes, cancers. All of these uh, are going to interfere with, with our patient that's being anticoagulated. Liver disease uh, can affect circulating levels of se uh, several endogenous procoagulants and anticoagulant factors, and this effect is probably greatest in individuals with very severe uh, liver disease, cirrhosis, and all those sorts of things. Um, kidney disease. Uh, 
can cause uremic platelet dysfunction and anemia, both of which can increase the bleeding risk. Uh, CKD uh, can affect the metabolism of DOACs, which are renally cleared uh, and excreted to some degree. Of, the, of all the DOACs, uh, the big getran is the most uh, dependent on renal clearance, approximately 80 to 85 percent. So someone with kidney disease, you don't want to use Pradaxa. Um, Apixaban is the least dependent on renal clearance, uh, about 25 percent. Uh, and this is pro uh, the, typically the, the drug of choice with renal uh, patients here. Uh, and all of the others kind of fall in between Pradaxa and, and Apixaban. Um, diabetes is another uh, another big one that may increase bleeding risk by effects of the vasculature um, on the vasculature as well as other complications related to chronic inflammation state. Cancer and cancer therapy can increase bleeding risk by causing thrombocytopenia, increasing inflammatory cytokines, and disrupting vascular integrity uh, at the primary tumor site or metastasis. Uh, tumor blood vessels are more likely to have structural and functionally immaturities or are more prone to bleed, they're more friable, which may also make them more inherently prone to bleeding. So uh, a big uh, concern in uh, patients that are being anticoagulated comes with the need uh, to use uh, concomitant antiplatelet medication or patients with, with uh, CAD that have had stents and they, they need to be on a dual antiplatelet therapy or aspirin or just, you know, uh, uh, P2Y12 uh, therapy for, for the coronary disease. So several studies have looked into this. Um, one of the first ones is warfarin plus aspirin versus DOAC plus aspirin. This is not dual antiplatelet, this is just aspirin comparing uh, DOAC and warfarin. And uh, this study specifically is a cohort study uh, of about uh, 14,000 patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, amongst these patients, the risk of intracranial hemorrhage was lower, of course. I mean, as we've seen in many uh, um, uh, studies comparing DOACs to warfarin, also adding aspirin, uh, uh, intracranial hemorrhage was lower with DOAC plus aspirin aspirin compared with warfarin plus aspirin at a um, hazard ratio of uh, 0 0.46. Um, and uh, the risk of GI bleeding was pretty similar. There was no uh, big differences between DOAX and warfarin plus aspirin. And any other bleeding was also uh, more prominent in the group with uh, warfarin plus, plus aspirin compared to DOAX plus aspirin. Um, dual versus single antiplatelet therapy with warfarin versus DOAC. Um, also, several uh, randomized trials. One of the, the bigger ones is Pioneer trial, uh, comparing bleeding rates with one of three approaches. So it's uh, uh, rivaroxaban, 15 milligrams, plus a P2Y12 inhibitor uh, versus rivaroxaban, 2.5, so much lower dose, low, uh, twice a day, um, daily, plus um, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy and uh, uh, P2Y12 inhibitor plus aspirin and or vitamin K plus uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. This is about 2,000 patients uh, with atrial fibrillation who had undergone uh, PCI and um, the clinically significant bleeding was lowest with rivaroxaban plus aspirin at about 17% uh, followed by rivaroxaban uh, plus dual antiplatelet therapy at about 18%, and then followed by as, uh, warfarin plus uh, dual antiplatelet therapy that jumps up to 27% uh, uh, risk of bleeding. Uh, the Augustus uh, randomized trial also evaluated uh, these comparisons, about uh, uh, 4,600 patients uh, with atrial fibrillation plus either acute coronary syndrome or PCI uh, who were uh, taking P2Y12 already uh, before the, any intervention were assigned to receive either a Pixaban or a warfarin, and ta uh, warfarin basically plus aspirin or placebo. So uh, the findings were similar with lower bleeding risk and those with, uh, who took uh, apixaban at about 10% versus uh, warfarin, uh, about 15%, and with placebo, and these are uh, you know, dual antiplatelet therapy, but if it, they had received placebo instead uh, of aspirin, it was about 9%, uh, and aspirin, 16%.
So uh, many bleeding risk, risk scores uh, have uh, been developed. Uh, one of the wider uh, used uh, uh, bleeding risk scores that we uh, tend to, to use is has bled. Now, any of these scores, uh, they really don't dictate 100% if we are going to go forward with anticoagulation or not, but it's to give us an idea on uh, where we are, uh, what we sh uh, expect uh, with, with a patient that we're starting anticoagulation uh, for, or if it's even worth you know going a different route uh, as as we said before with, with another mechanical means of stroke prevention. Now, I'm not going to uh, go into detail on, on all of the, the validation of the scores, but just to kind of give you a, an idea of what these scores look at, uh, look at basically, uh, to decide uh, what the bleeding score, uh, risk score is for, for each patient. So, HASBLED looks at hypertension as being the H, and it, you get one point per each of these uh, elements of the of the, of the uh, scale. So A looks at a, abnormal renal and liver function, and you get one point for each. Uh, so this is the one that can give you two points. Stroke is another point. Uh, bleeding tendency or predisposition is another one. Um, L for label uh, INRs if the patient is on warfarin. E, elderly, and we're talking about uh, older than 65 years old, gives you another point. And D for drugs, uh, and these uh, or could be aspirin or NSAIDs, uh, or another point for uh, excess alcohol use. And as we see, as uh, you get more points, uh, you, your uh, bleeds per 100 patient year increases. And above five points, there's insufficient data, but you can say that the bleeding risk is, is pretty high for, for a patient with more than five points. Other um, uh, scores uh, that, that are used, it, it, this is a, came from a pretty big trial, uh, it's called Atria. This one looks at anemia, gives you three points, several uh, severe renal disease, um, age more than 75 as compared to the Hasblad one that you uh, caught off of 65 years old, uh, any prior hemorrhage, and uh, diagnosed hypertension. These are the elements that this, uh, um, this scale looks at. Uh, other ones like hemorrhages, uh, look a, a few more items here, but again, same concept uh, on, on looking and kind of uh, assessing what, what the bleeding risk for the patient is and what to expect down the line when, when starting anticoagulation. So uh, talking about risk reduction for, for someone that needs to be on anticoagulation. So risk of anticoagulant associated bleeding can be minimized by periodically uh, reviewing the uh, indication for anticoagulation. Uh, risk benefit ratio, dose uh, anticoagulant adherence, concomitant medications, uh, including antiplatelet uh, agents, uh, NSAIDs, and other over-the-counter medications, and patient comorbidities that may affect uh, the dosing. So uh, combined use of anticoagulants and antiplatelet medication should be restricted to settings in which the benefit is expected to out outweigh the risk of, of bleeding. Um, patients should avoid routine use of NSAIDs for pain or fever when other agents such as um, uh, acetaf acetaminophen um, or Tylenol are available and when an NSAID is indicated, patients should limit the duration of the use um, and or use a selective COX-2 inhibitor if appropriate for whatever is needed. Good blood pressure control is important and attention to fall risk may be helpful. Gastric protection is widely used on these patients with PPIs or, uh, you know, uh, H2 blockers in these patients despite uh, limited evidence of efficacy. Thank you so much for your attention.